You know, um, a lot of uh, men complain about having to wait for their wives. Have you heard that before? You know, waiting outside of uh, stores, you know, forever and that sort of thing. I think that's why there's benches in mall hallways, right? It's for the waiting husbands. But I also know that um, a lot of wives do a lot of waiting for their husbands, too. Waiting for them to do the things that they said they would do around the house, right? Yeah, right. I know my wife can relate to this, but it's like I tell her, I, I, I said I'll fix it. You don't have to remind me every six months. Yeah. Thank you. I'm here all week, folks. But our poor wives are stuck waiting, waiting for us to do what we said we were going to do. And you know, waiting, waiting is a big theme in the Bible. Waiting on the Lord, waiting for God to answer prayer, waiting on God to lead us and direct us, waiting on God to fulfill his promises. In fact, this whole period of history that we're in is a period of waiting for Jesus to come back. And so waiting is this big theme through the Bible, but waiting isn't easy. The waiting period can often be a period of confusion and disappointment. Paul, the Apostle Paul, had an extended period of waiting before his ministry as a traveling missionary really got started. The in-between years. The years in between his Damascus Road experience, which we talked about last Sunday when he accepted Christ, and the launch of his first missionary journey. We're going to talk about that period of time in Paul's life today and think about waiting on the Lord and what we ought to be doing when we're waiting on him. So the series is called Paul's Epic Mediterranean Road Trip as we're going to follow Paul on his uh, missionary journeys around the Mediterranean. And the message this morning, part two, the in-between years. So let's talk about the story. As I said last week, Saul of Tarsus, so Paul before he became widely known as Paul, was known primarily by his Hebrew name, Saul of Tarsus. He was a promising young leader in Pharisaic Judaism. He grew up in Tarsus, went to Jerusalem, trained there under Gamaliel, and and was now working on behalf of the Jewish temple authority to try and stamp out Christianity. And Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, and he instantly becomes a believer in Christ. We talked about that last week. And a message comes to him through another Christian named Ananias that this Saul, Jesus says, is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. So Saul, right from the very start, has this incredible, after he has this incredible paradigm-shifting, life-altering experience, and right from the very start has this promise of God that he will be among those who take this message of Jesus, the gospel, the good news, that Jesus is the Messiah and all that he's done, out to the whole world, not just to the Jewish people, but to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles as well, and even to kings wow, that's quite a promise, a massive promise on this baby Christian's life that you're going to do this. You're going to be the one that I send out. So Saul gets right at it, right? Is that how the story goes? Well, not exactly. You know, I always sort of imagined it that way. I always sort of pictured it like, you know, Saul gets saved on the Damascus Road, yada, yada, yada. He heads out on his first missionary journey. But that yada, yada, yada... (laughs) is at least, at least 10 years. 10 years. Maybe you didn't know that. What happens in that decade plus of waiting for this promise to be fulfilled in his life? Well, the scriptures don't lay it all out for us. We have to do a little bit of piecing together uh, of various texts, but we are able to get a pretty good understanding of how we spent this time. For starters, after spending a little time in Damascus, when he first became a Christian, we know that Saul, Paul, traveled to Arabia, and we know this because Paul told us this in his letter to the churches in Galatia. 
in uh, Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, it says this, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. This is Paul writing here now. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me on the Damascus road, so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, he says, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. So he goes to Damascus, has this time with Ananias, spends some time in, in Damascus, and before he ever goes down to Jerusalem, after the basket escape, it says he went into Arabia for a period of time. Now, where is Arabia in the first century understanding? Not Saudi Arabia, necessarily. Um, as you can see by this map here, the orange blob is what the people of that time considered to be Arabia. And the main city of that region, of that province of the Roman Empire, was Petra. Petra. And so, it's quite likely that Paul, during this time in Arabia, spent some time in Petra. But it's also speculated that he may have gone down to Mount Sinai. And he, he uh, be, and had sort of a Moses slash Elijah sort of Mount Sinai experience there. But we're speculating at this point. We don't really know. We don't really know what he was doing in the deserts of Arabia. Um, but it does seem likely that this time in his life was a time of sort of spiritual preparation, a time of probably studying the Hebrew Scriptures, right, and trying to make sense in his mind of what has happened. You know, he, he is a student of the Scriptures, and he's had this encounter with Jesus that has just totally reoriented his whole understanding of what the Scriptures say. And so now, I suspect during this time in Arabia, he is studying the scrolls, He's probably consulting with rabbis and doing all sorts of things and having alone time with God, you know, to sort all of this out in his mind. So he spends this time there in preparation. We don't know how long, except we do know that in the next verse in Galatians, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem. So so he either spent three years in Arabia or he spent some time in Arabia and went back to Damascus. But overall, before he ever went down to Jerusalem to meet Peter and the other apostles, it was three years that had passed. Three years. He says, so three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And I declare before God that what I'm writing to you is not a lie. Okay, so Paul's telling us the truth. (laughs) Um, So this matches pretty closely with what we read in Acts uh, chapter 9 about Saul going to Jerusalem eventually after some time in Damascus. When you read it in Acts 9, it, just feel, it seems like it was just almost, you know, within a few days, but it was three years. Okay, so he goes down to uh, Jerusalem. And after a short time in Jerusalem, Acts 9 tells us that he left there and went up north after a threat on his life. Let's read that in Acts chapter 9, verses 28 to 30. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went around all Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. We know from Galatians that that was 15 days that he spent there in Jerusalem. It says, He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. So you go back to the map there, you can see where Caesarea is. So Jerusalem, Caesarea is a little bit north, but... The Bible always talks about Jerusalem as being up because it's on a mountain. So it says we went down to Caesarea, even though in our imagination he went up to Caesarea because we look at the map and we think about north. But he went down to Caesarea, got on a boat, and they sent him back to Tarsus, his hometown. Okay, so let's review his travels at this point. He was, grew up in Tarsus. And then as a young man, went to Jerusalem to train and study in the Pharisaic tradition of the Jewish faith. Uh, and, and during that time, Christianity emerged, and he got, of course, very angry about that. And on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians, Jesus met him, he, uh, and he got saved. And then he spent some time in Arabia, in that region somewhere, doing something. Three years, pa- he goes back to Damascus. 
that's a three-year period of time, and then he goes back down to Jerusalem, spends 15 days there. Then he's in danger. They say, we're going to get you out of here, Saul, because you're, there's a threat to your life. Gets on a boat in Caesarea and heads back to his hometown of Tarsus. All right, that's Paul's Mediterranean road trip at this point in his story. Now, think about Saul arriving home in Tarsus. He's still a young man. He had set out, left home for Jerusalem, a promising, smart, young student who went and trained in the finest school in Jerusalem to become potentially you know, a religious leader in the Pharisaic tradition, made his mom and dad proud. Our son, he's going off to Jerusalem. He's going to be a Pharisee. Woo-hoo. We're a great family. And then years later, he shows up on his parents' doorstep. I'm back. But guess what? His plans have completely changed. His beliefs have completely changed. He's a completely different person. Did his parents welcome him back home? Did he go back to his old bedroom that they'd turned into a gym or something? <laughs> or, did they, or did they turn him away for his crazy new ideas? We don't know. We don't know. But I do know that this is a, surely a very confusing time in Paul's life, Saul's life. I suspect his family probably did reject him, at least some of his family, certainly they would have. And I'm sure that many young adults can relate to this experience, right? Like, didn't plan to go back home, but hey, I'm living with mom and dad again, and boy, I'm quite different now, and I don't really agree with everything that I believe now, and oh, it's a confusing time. So this is what was going on in Saul's life. Wow. Scholars say that he lived in his hometown of Tarsus here now for, for somewhere, but, uh, from somewhere between seven to ten years in this time now. And that time ended when a visitor from away came calling. More on that in a minute. But what was he doing during this silent decade? Again, we have no record. We don't know what he was doing. We can only speculate that he was working, working as a tent maker. That was his family's trade, and that was a big profession in Tarsus. Um, while serving in and leading in the new community of Jesus followers that had sprung up in Tarsus. We do know that he was preaching and was making a name for himself as a preacher during that time. But I think about this 10 years in Paul's life, 10 or however many years it was, of, 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 of a decade of quiet faithfulness. 10 years of working, you know, going to work every day, fellowshipping with other Christians, sharing his faith, learning, growing, serving, and waiting. Waiting. Waiting on the Lord for the next thing. Waiting on the Lord for this promise to be fulfilled. Well, the next thing would be a knock on the door from Barnabas. Barnabas. You remember him? Uh, Saul first met Barnabas in Jerusalem, and Barnabas vouched for Saul when others questioned his newfound faith in Jesus. We talked about that a little last week, a little bit last week. And now here was Barnabas showing up again to invite Saul to come and help the church in Antioch in the province of Syria. You can see that on the map there as well. So let's read about what was happening in Antioch and why there was this need for Saul to go there. In Acts chapter 11, we have that, verses 19 and so forth. It says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus. Cyprus is that, if you go back to the map there for a sec, uh, Cyprus is that large island below Tarsus, okay, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, They traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. 
the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. It was starting. It was starting. God had already opened the Apostle Peter's mind to the idea that Gentiles were going to be able to be part of this Christian faith when, he, uh, when Paul led a, a Roman centurion named Cornelius to faith. But now, for the first recorded time, Christians were intentionally preaching the gospel to non-Jewish people. Wow, it's starting to happen. This thing that God promised Saul 10 years before. It's starting to happen. And I love the response. People are accepting Christ, uh, and many, many people in Antioch of Syria were joining the Jesus movement. A large number of people, including Gentiles, believe the Lord. So the church in Antioch is alive. Side note, it's interesting that we never get the name the names of these missionaries from uh, Cyprus and Cyrene. We don't know who they are. Um, Paul would later get the acclaim as the great missionary to the Gentiles, but these unnamed pioneers are the ones who paved the way. And I think of them as among the many thousands, if not millions, of unsung heroes of the Christian faith over the centuries who have served faithfully without recognition on earth but surely who will receive great rewards in heaven. Amen? Amen. So, Barnabas was sent by the church in Jerusalem to go check out what was going on in Antioch, in Syria. And I say Antioch in Syria because there's two Antiochs, and later in Paul's story he's going to a different Antioch. But Antioch of Syria. So, Barnabas goes and sees, this is really good. What God is doing here is awesome. This is a good thing. God is blessing it. But boy, do we need help. Because this is on, the church is on fire here, it's great, it's exciting, but we need leaders. And so, Barnabas decides, I need to go find Saul. It's time. So he goes to Tarsus to find Saul, and that's in Acts eleven twenty five. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Okay, about Antioch. This was a uh, major city, the third largest city in the Roman Empire, uh, behind Rome and Alexandria and Egypt. About half a million people lived there at the time, and Saul shows up. I like how Barnabas sort of taps Saul on the shoulder and says, you, I see in you something good. And, 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 and I think there's a little lesson here, a side note lesson, that um, it's really... So Barnabas is known as the encourager, and he's really good at that. And, and I think as us, as Christians, when we see in other believers potential for leadership and ministry giftedness, we should tap them on the shoulder and say, I see in you something good, and, and have those I see in you conversations. That's how you can remember that. I see in you. I see in you something that's really good. I, I see in you that God has giftedness that, that it can be used for his glory. Have those conversations when you see that with people. It's one of the easiest ways to be an encouragement, to be a Barnabas to a brother or sister in Christ. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas have uh, a year there teaching. We learn of them taking up, a, another thing they did was took up a special offering for the church in Jerusalem that was experiencing a hard time. Saul and Barnabas deliver that. And the followers of Christ get called Christians here for the first time in Antioch, which was meant as a, a slur uh, from their enemies, but obviously it stuck. You know, we're still called Christians today. Uh, to be a Christian, a Christian, is to be a follower of Christ, so it seems good to me. Um, so they spend a year there. Great. And Paul, this ministry to Gentiles is starting. It's another year in Saul's discipleship as a follower of Jesus and his development as a leader. And then, in Acts 13... It says, among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work 
to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. And thus begins Saul's first missionary journey. Okay, so that's the story in a nutshell of this 10 plus years of Paul's life between his Damascus Road conversion and the beginning of his first missionary journey across the Mediterranean world. A decade, at least, of waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. The promise that he would take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Gentiles across the world. A decade of waiting. Okay, so here's the big lesson for this morning that I want us to take from this part of Paul's story. And that is this. Sometimes God makes us wait for his plan to unfold, and that's okay. I'm sure that some of you have been waiting a long time for things in your life to unfold in certain ways. You've been praying, you've been believing, you believe the promises of God, but you're waiting. You're waiting. I remember the years uh, sort of between high school and getting married and starting a family and starting my career as a pastor. And that time, you know, those college and university years, uh, those were years of waiting on God and trusting Him big time when I, I couldn't see where His plans for me were headed. And I thought I had a plan, but then I said, God, it's, all your, it's, it's up to you. You're in charge. I surrendered my life to Him. And then it was like, whoo, now I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I don't know what God has for me. I just got to have to trust him and hold on as he steers this ship. We talked about that uh, a few weeks ago when I talked about, um, is he the captain of your soul from the book of James? But during that time in my life, um, a pastor in in my church, our associate pastor, I've talked about him before, uh, Stuart Williams. Pastor Stuart Williams, yeah, remember him? Um, He he, he wrote a little note for me, an encouraging, um, an encouraging little, just a slip of paper just had a scripture reference on it. And man, it was an encouragement to me at that point in my life. And the note just said, Isaiah 40, 27 to 31. That's all it said. So I looked it up. (laughs) And this is what it said. And man, did it stay with me and help me through that time in my life. It said this, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Why do you have this sense that God doesn't see you that God doesn't know what's going on in your life. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases his strength. Even youths, even youths, even young adults, even young people, even teenagers, even kids, shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But... Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Amen. The Lord, the Lord meets us in the waiting. He's with us in the waiting. When it feels like he's forgotten us, he hasn't. He hasn't. When we're wondering if we can really trust him, we can. He will come through for us in his way, in his time. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is so faithful. So why does he make us wait? (laughs) This is a good question. Why does he make us wait? You know, there could be many reasons why he makes us wait. Things we cannot see or understand from our limited perspective, but I'm certain that one of the reasons that God makes us wait is to grow us. There is growth that happens in the waiting. And it seems to me that this growth is often necessary for us to be ready for the next thing that God has for us. The waiting is often a time of preparation and testing for the next chapter, as it was for Saul. If you're in a waiting period, by the way, you're in good company. 
There's lots of people in the Bible that had to wait. Think about Abraham. He was 75 years old before God promised him that he would have children. And not just children, but he would father an entire nation. He was 75 years old. Talk about having to wait. But then guess what? God made him wait another 25 years before his son was born. He was 100. Holy cow. (laughs) Moses had 40 years, 40 years living in the wilderness before God would call him to go back to Egypt to set the people of Israel free. And then another 40 years in the desert before they even went back to the promised land. David, think about David. David was anointed by King Saul, different Saul in the Old Testament, uh, to become the king of Israel. David, you're the guy. I anoint you. You are now, in God's eyes, the king of Israel. But guess what? 20, for him, another 25 years. 25 years before he actually took the throne. Sometimes God makes us wait. And we can't, we go, God, I don't understand why this is taking so long. But you know, his timing, his way, with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. But we've got to trust him. Sometimes God just sees fit to make us wait. And that's okay. He has purpose in it. So, that's some, why God makes us wait? Well, there's reasons. The next question, though, is what ought we to be doing in the waiting period? Twiddling our thumbs? Scrolling Facebook? Well, the answer is clear. clear. We need to keep on serving the Lord wherever He has us, faithfully plugging away at the work. He has set before us day by day. Though we don't know all the details of what Saul was doing in this decade, this quiet decade of his life, we can safely assume he was faithfully serving his church, sharing his faith, and going about his job as a tent maker. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, if that's what God has for you during this season of your life, that's not only okay, that's good, that's beautiful. I like the phrase, bloom where you're planted. You've heard people say that. I think it's a good way to live. Bloom where you're planted. uh, There's an Old Testament passage as well when the people of Israel were uh, in exile in Babylon. And and the prophet said to them, the word of the Lord is to seek the welfare of the city where you are. Have families, get married, raise children, work, do jobs. Even in exile, even in that period that they were waiting to go back. God said, seek the welfare of the city. Wherever you are, whatever, wherever God has you, do what is clearly he has called you to do. Live for Jesus. Be a blessing. Love your neighbors, and so on and so on. Your life may not be at this very moment everything that you dreamed it to be. But will you be faithful to the Lord nevertheless right where he has you right now? You know, <clears throat> it's my practice here to quote, as I preach, I try to use the Old Testament and the New Testament and Star Wars. <laughs> and so, of course, my mind went to Master Yoda, who spoke to Luke Skywalker this very thing. And the Empire Strikes Back, he was talking about Luke Skywalker when he said, All his life? Has he looked away to the future, to the horizon? Never his mind on where he was, Mm, what he was doing. (laughs) And then again, in The Last Jedi, when Force Ghost Yoda reappears to old Luke, Mm, Skywalker, still looking to the horizon, never here now, the need in in front of your nose. Such wisdom from Master Yoda. Mm, yes. Mm, yes, wise he is. Mm. <laughs> the si- <laughs> Thank you. The simple me- <laughs> Shannon gave me a look of disapproval. <laughs> the simple message today is this: as you wait on the Lord for whatever He has in store for you, be found faithful where you are attentive to the world around you and its needs, doing the work of a disciple of Jesus Christ, giving away free clothes to your neighbors, 
and so on and so on. We need more unsung heroes of the faith, the faithful, consistent saints who wash the dishes and prepare the food and scrub the toilets, who go to work and represent Jesus well in their workplaces, who be good neighbors, who raise kids and help raise other people's kids and teach Bible study, and so on, and so on, and so on. And if that's one of you, if you're one of those secret saints, thank you. Thank you. You might not get recognized and rewarded in this life, but boy, you're going to be showered in blessings in heaven. And whatever God has in store for you, you can trust His promises and His presence while you wait. Amen. Let me pray.